Thank you. Uh, before I start, I just want to make sure everyone can hear me. And can the people in the back hear me? OK, if at any point you can't, please just raise your hand or get my attention in some way um, so that we can take care of that. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. It's really very moving to me to see all of you here. And um, before I start my talk, uh, there's some very important people I'd like to thank. Um, Aviva from UB and the uh, UB Communications Outreach Officer, Denise Wolf. Uh, thank you so much, John, for your introduction, and Anne Conable, whom I've known for years. Um, for, she is the Community Engagement Manager here at the library. Um, I want to give a special thanks to Omar Brown, who's in the back, uh, for setting up the PowerPoint for me and assisting on all the technical matters and making everything look easy. And he didn't believe me when I told him that usually these technical matters are not easy. So um, that shows how gifted he is at, at this work. Um, thank you to Wendy Bells at UB for assisting me with my travel. Uh, to PhD candidate Caitlin Engel for her assistance every step of the way. Um, and to all the students of the UB Arts Collaborative Working Artists Lab. I had the privilege of speaking with Caitlin Liu a few days ago, and I look forward to meeting the other UB students involved in this project. Um, I already know that their dedication and enthusiasm are really inspiring, and I think can give us all hope for the future. Um, a big thanks to all of the workshop co-directors, uh, including Professor Stacy Hubbard and Maria Horn, and especially Professor Carrie Brayman, who gave me crucial help this afternoon by getting me here. I really appreciated that. Um, Anna Camp is here from the Folger Shakespeare Library. Uh, thank you for all your help. And above all, I want to thank Barbara Bono. Um, she first approached me about this conference I don't know, years ago, and then the, of course the pandemic was with us longer than any of us expected, and I've been thrilled and delighted to watch how the programming has developed over the past years, and working with you, Barbara, has been a real delight, so thank you. And finally, a big thank you to Jonathan Welch of Talking Leaves Bookstore. Uh, Jonathan is set up in the lobby. Um, you know, I can't ever stress enough how lucky Buffalo is to have an independent bookstore like Talking Leaves. So many independent bookstores have closed as online shopping has become more prominent. Um, I urge you all, please support Talking Leaves. Please keep this treasure in Buffalo. Um, not simply for my books, but for all of your books. Um, it's really important that we have a resource like talking leaves here. Um, speaking at the main branch of the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library is such an honor for me, especially because the library played a tremendous role in the creation of this novel. Um, I did so much of the research right here and found things that were frankly remarkable to me. Um, I found newspaper clipping files going back to the early part of the 20th century, as just files filled with newspaper clippings, where I made all kinds of unusual discoveries in folders that they had with titles like Big Houses of Buffalo. <laughs> well, wouldn't you know some of my characters lived in those big houses, so I was able to pull details out of those uh, newspaper articles. Um, they also had telephone directories from the early part of the 20th century, and I was able to look up the telephone numbers of all my characters. And um, this was a very eerie experience because, you know, you see the number there, and I think, well, I could call them. <laughs> uh, it made everything very alive, very tactile, and I actually imagined calling them on the phone, what I would say to them then that also got a little terrifying, so I had to stop doing that because I didn't want to conjure up their actual ghosts. Um, I also have to give my thanks to this, to 
the role that this particular branch of the library played in my life. Uh, starting when I was about 12 years old, I used to take the bus by myself uh, downtown to the library and search to find books on whatever topic I was interested in at that moment. Um, and when I was young, I used to get strange obsessions. I had a, an obsession for Napoleon and uh, other things I won't go into, but I would come down here to the library and research those obsessions. Um, the summer before I started high school at the Buffalo Seminary, um, I decided to read my way through the biography section here at the library, starting with the letter A. So my dream was to start at A and then read straight through. And I actually got almost to the letter B. So that was really, was really good. Um, so I want to give a special thanks to this library and to every librarian who's ever worked here for providing a pl place of refuge for an only child like me, a child who might have been lonely and alone, but I never felt that way because I had books. I had all the books in this library at my disposal and I felt that they filled my life. So thank you. So today, I want to talk about how the city of Buffalo inspired my novel, City of Light. I want to tell you about how the extraordinary architecture of this city and the parks and the parkways shaped my imagination when I was growing up. And then later, when I was an adult, helped me to create a vision of the city in fiction. So my first awareness of Buffalo's remarkable architecture was terrifying. These are the towers of what was called the Buffalo State Hospital, designed by H.H. H. Richardson. When I was six and seven years old, uh, I lived with my parents um, on Richmond Avenue, essentially across the street from the hospital. I saw these towers every day when I stepped outside. And my friends and I used to discuss whether someone was watching us from those towers, someone with a giant telescope. My terror was compounded by the fact that neighborhood parents often told misbehaving children, even very young children, that if they didn't mend their ways, they'd be sent to the hospital. Now, of course, I never misbehaved, and so no one ever said that to me. But even so, I'm surprised that I didn't grow up to write horror stories. I was deeply disappointed decades later to discover that no one lives in that, those towers, no one even works in those towers, and no one ever has. They're purely decorative, just for show. Here's another building that shaped my imagination, the Central Terminal Railroad Station. I remember being young and coming here with my parents to catch the train to Chicago, the first leg of a cross-country journey. It was a fitting place, this terminal, to begin journeys of the mind and spirit. I toured the terminal recently, and it's still monumental and glorious, and I hope that someday it will be restored. My next awareness of Buffalo's architecture was the Butler Mansion on Delaware Avenue, built in 1896. Yes, it looks beautiful now, but when I was a girl, it was boarded up and looked like a ruin. An older woman lived here, I was told, and she lived all alone, or so the story went, and she grew ever older behind the boarded up windows. No one ever told me that the woman growing old there was a living link to the city's days of glory. She was Kate Robinson Butler, in her later years, the publisher of the Buffalo Evening News, as it was then called. She'd moved to Buffalo in 1909 after her marriage to Edward Butler Jr., who was the son of the founder of the Buffalo News. Decades of history played out over the course of her 80-some years, and she had a leadership role in the city. 
Here's one of the saddest memories of my childhood. This is Humboldt Parkway. I'm old enough to remember Humboldt Parkway. It was two miles long, 200 feet wide, with six rows of trees across. Look at the perspective of the line of trees going into the distance. I remember driving here with my mother on Sunday afternoons and the sunlight glittering through the cathedral-like canopy of trees and sparking my imagination. I still get choked up when I think about how that beautiful parkway was destroyed to build a highway that cut through the east side of the city in the process destroying a vibrant and historic black neighborhood. I'm thrilled about the steps being taken today to restore part, at least, of Olmsted's masterpiece and reunite the sections of the city separated by the highway. This is the Ellicott Square building, designed by the renowned architect Daniel Burnham. When it was completed in 1896, it was the largest office building in the world. But when I was a teenager, the Ellicott Square building was important to me for one reason only, and an extremely important reason at that. The Department of Motor Vehicles was at the top of that staircase. When the time came for me to get my learner's permit, I went downtown, and suddenly there I was, amidst the mosaic floors and the wrought iron filigree, in a place far removed from my everyday life. I clearly remember thinking, wow, what's this doing here? Where did this building come from? Why is it here? But I didn't pursue the question because I had, to me, more important issues to think about, like parallel parking. My reaction to the Ellicott Square building was, I'm sorry to say, typical of that era. During my youth, Buffalo was dying. Industries were leaving and unemployment was high. My friends and I spent hours talking about how and when we would escape Buffalo. We weren't educated to take pride in the city or to look back to our city's history for inspiration. And so as the years passed, I went to college and like most of my friends, I rarely returned to Buffalo. One day, about 20 years ago though, I made an astonishing discovery and my opinion of my hometown changed forever. I was visiting Buffalo to see my parents and one afternoon when my mom was babysitting my son, who was about five or six then, I happened to wander into a deserted exhibition at the Buffalo Historical Museum. The exhibit was about the city's history and it focused on Buffalo in 1901, the year of the Pan American Exposition. What I learned in the next few hours amazed me. 120 some years ago now, Buffalo was a place of immense wealth, political influence, and technological and industrial innovation. How did this come about? Well, I learned that the origins of Buffalo's prosperity went back decades and were closely tied to geography. So this map shows Western New York, shows New York State with Buffalo and Niagara Falls clearly marked. As you can see, Buffalo is the final Great Lakes port before the waterfall, and the waterfall blocked, the sh blocked shipping. Here's a broader view of the entire Great Lakes region. And then, so in the 19th century, in the first half of the 20th century, till the opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway, all Great Lakes shipping ended at Buffalo. This means that the great bulk of the raw materials produced in the interior of the country made their way by ship across the Great Lakes to this city. After arriving here, these raw materials were transferred to barges along the Erie Canal, and then later, by the time of the Civil War, to trains heading to the industrial and commercial centers of the East Coast. Grain, iron ore, lumber, coal, cattle, they all passed through Buffalo. And in turn, finished goods from the East Coast heading for the interior of the country passed through Buffalo too. 
immigrants by the tens of thousands transferred from ships, from trains to ships here in Buffalo as they made their way to new homes in the Midwest. Buffalo became one of the busiest ports on earth, the commu commercial gateway between East and West. It became the largest grain port in the world, as well as the largest flour milling center in the world. It became a prosperous manufacturing city, producing a wide range of products, everything from shoes to furniture to heavy machinery, and as time went on, ships and steel. It was a railroad hub, and hundreds of trains went through Buffalo every day. Hydroelectric power was being developed in nearby Niagara Falls, and electricity was transforming the nation, creating new industries, such as aluminum manufacturing. This was the, era, the, this was the era when Buffalo became known as the City of Light, because Buffalo was the first city in America to receive alternating electrical current to light its streets and buildings. That electrical current came from Niagara Falls. And of course, I used the phrase City of Light as the title for the novel. This is the interior of the Adams Power Station above Niagara Falls. It was designed by the renowned architect Stanford White, and it was designed to be what they thought of in those days as a cathedral of power. Buffalo had become the Silicon Valley of its day. And brought here by the city's extraordinary wealth, the greatest architects in the nation came to Buffalo to work. They designed public and commercial buildings, like the Ellicott Square building we saw earlier, and like the post office here. They designed the Prudential Guarantee Building, an extraordinary landmark in architectural history, designed by Lewis Sullivan. And you see two pictures of that. It's really an extraordinary building that was saved from destruction when I was a girl. The architects also designed remarkable private homes, primarily along Delaware Avenue for the city's many millionaires. Here's an example of just one of them. In 1901, Buffalo had 60 millionaires, a huge number during an era when a million dollars was considered an astronomical amount of money. This is the Knox House, also on Delaware Avenue. And this shows a view looking out at Delaware Avenue from the carriage drive of the Knox House. And you know, these gigantic homes were not far away in the suburbs of the city or far off in the countryside. They were right here. They're close to where we're sitting right now. Because of its prominence, Buffalo received the honor of being chosen to host a World's Fair, the Pan American Exposition in 1901. Here is the triumphal gateway to the grounds. Uh, this is located roughly near the Art Gallery and the Delaware Park Lake and the entry ramp to the Skijakwita Expressway. I think essentially just over the entry ramp to the expressway. Here's an example of the grounds of the exposition. And please note in the background there, the twin towers of the Richardson Center. So this gives you a real sense of where the exposition was located. Although of course those towers loom over everything. So they loomed in my imagination. This is the electric tower, which was built to pay homage to the hydroelectric power coming from Niagara Falls to light the exposition at night. This was a buffalo I had never heard about, had never even caught a glimmer of in my childhood. And the discovery struck me with the force of a revelation. After I toured the exhibit that day, I went for a walk in Delaware Park. I still felt staggered by what I'd seen. Now at this time in my life, I'd had several short stories and some essays and reviews published here and there. 
I had decided to become a writer when I was six years old. My early works were primarily stories about heroic pets. By the time I reached high school, my extraordinary teachers at the Buffalo Seminary were encouraging my ambition as a writer, and under their guidance, I submitted poems to literary magazines around the country. I collected rejection letters from all the best places. And in fact, I had a very long road to publishing success. My first short story was published when I was well into adulthood after 43 rejections. Now my second short story was much more successful and that was published after only 27 rejections. This was before the days of self-publishing. Um, but through that process of rejection, I never gave up. That's something I think I learned from, be, from growing up here in Buffalo, that you never give up, you can't give up. So for many months, I'd been searching for a topic for a novel. I wanted to write a novel which would show the broad sweep of history played out through everyday lives. To me, fiction is by far the best medium for exploring the interaction between society and the individual. So that day, after wandering Delaware Park for a while, I sat down on the shores of Delaware Park Lake. Now, when I was young, Delaware Park Lake looked like this. It was clogged with garbage and rainbowed by grease. This is exactly my childhood memory of Delaware Park Lake. But on that day that I went to the Historical Society, the lake looked like this. After a multi-year cleanup effort, it was beautiful, as beautiful as it must have been a century ago during the Pan American Exposition. It had been renamed Hoyt Lake. I stared into the still water, which revealed to me a perfect reflection of the sky's drifting clouds. And then all at once, in a moment of insight, I saw the novel that I had to write. I had the to tell the story of my city. I had to paint its portrait at its moment of glory. But where would I begin, I thought. How would I find my way into the city's history? I realized that I needed to set the novel in 1901 and structure it around the Pan American Exposition, culminating in the death of President McKinley. This would provide a natural narrative structure. And next, I asked myself, who would narrate the story? And in another moment of insight, I suddenly knew who my narrator would be. Just up Frederick Law Olmsted's Lincoln Parkway from where I sat was the Buffalo Seminary High School. When I was a student at SEM, I'd heard stories about the legendary headmistresses in the school's history and of the power these women had held in the community. During that era, few women had power or control over their own lives but these female educators did. And such a woman, I realized, would be the ideal narrator. And so I created Louisa Barrett. The next day, I returned home to New York City and began to research and plan the novel. Immediately, I learned how important Buffalo was in 1901 because the libraries of New York City were bursting with information about Buffalo. When I started researching the novel, I also began to understand for the first time the vast impact that Frederick Law Olmsted had on this city. He came to Buffalo in 1868, just after the Civil War. He was invited here by the city's civic leaders who paid for his visit. Buffalo's topography inspired him to design America's first interconnected system of urban parks and parkways. Over the course of several decades, Olmsted and his firm built in Buffalo, and it's astonishing to read this, six major parks, seven residential parkways, eight traffic circles, four small parks, Parkside, a neighborhood of curving streets near Delaware Park, 
the landscape around the state hospital, green spaces around civic buildings, and at Olmsted's instruction, thousands of trees were planted along the city's streets, mostly American elms. And unfortunately, the fact that most of these trees were elms created a traumatizing disaster decades later when Dutch elm disease spread in the 1960s and the city lost almost all of its trees in a very short period of time. But that came later. I was surprised to learn that Olmsted designed the landscape around the state hospital, the very building that had terrified me when I was young. Olmsted believed that nature and light could cure psychological disturbance. This was a common and comforting belief in the years after the upheavals of the Civil War. The war had touched every family in the nation. I also learned that the landscape around the hospital included a working farm where hospital patients planted and harvested crops and kept dairy cows. This farm is now the site of the campus of the Buffalo State College. Buffalo State moved to the new campus in 1931. Now notice the church in the background of this slide so you can position the scene in the neighborhood if you're from Buffalo. By studying old photographs and postcards of Buffalo as part of my research, I began to see the city in a new way and to imagine what it must have been like in the decades around 1901. This is Delaware Park. This is the wading pool at Humboldt Park. The wading pools at Riverside Park. These waterways at Riverside Park are artificial, but Olmsted designed them to look like a flowing stream in a forest. This is Lincoln Parkway, Days Park. And this is one of my favorites. This is Bidwell Parkway. And you can see my high school, the Buffalo Seminary, behind that beautiful dog. It's that yellow building in the background, which is why I like this picture. Um, here's a sampling of some old photographs I found. This is Richmond Avenue in the 1910s, I'm guessing, and Delaware Avenue in the 1930s. I decided early on to make the book a blend of real people and fictional characters so that I could accurately portray the city while still being free to develop the fictional story and let that fictional story carry me wherever I wanted to go. Here are some of the real people in the novel. This is Ansley Wilcox with Mariah Love. These two led the charitable relief programs in the city, and they had very strict ideas of who was deserving of charity. They made certain that only people they considered deserving received health, a policy which led to inequity, discrimination, and poverty. These are two of the wealthy industrialists of the city, Dexter Rumsey and John Albright. Albright in particular was a great philanthropist creating the art museum that bears his name. This is Louise Blanchard Bethune. She was the first American woman known to have had a career as a professional architect. And she was an inspiration to the women architects who followed. Among other buildings, she designed the Hotel Lafayette right across the street from where we are today. Here's President Grover Cleveland and his wife, Frances Folsom Cleveland. The, Grover Cleveland was mayor of Buffalo, went on to become governor of New York State and president of the United States. Frances Folsom Cleveland grew up here in Buffalo, and he was quite a bit older than she, and uh, he pushed her baby carriage around the city when she was a baby which I always found to be very unusual and touching in a certain way. Uh, <laughs> uh, when Cleveland was governor, he was known for returning to Buffalo on the weekends and having fist fights on the street outside bars with journalists. And I can't quite see Governor Hochul doing that. Um, 
During his first presidential campaign, a story came out that he had fathered a child out of wedlock and that he'd had the mother imprisoned until she agreed to give the child up for adoption. That's what's uh, illustrated here in this picture. Uh, this was a story that he never denied to his credit. This is Albert Hubbard, who founded the Roycroft movement. Now, Hubbard is a very complex figure. Um, as some of you may know, uh, the Roycrofters created books on handmade paper. They made furniture and beautiful decorative objects. The Roycroft movement was part of the international arts and crafts movement. It represented a rejection of industrialization and a return to creating objects by hand with the idea that everyday objects can and should possess great beauty and that their beauty should be brought into individual lives. And as wonderful as that is, though I also think it's important to remember that Albert Hubbard was able to create the Roycroft community in East Aurora only because he had earned a very large fortune through his work with the Larkin Soap Company here in Buffalo. Many of his critics thought of him as a hypocrite and a charlatan, and for this very reason. He had the ability to reject industrialization because he had profited from it tremendously personally. So as I say, he is a complex figure, but Roycroft is wonderful. So that's his legacy, and it is a wonderful legacy. Through my research, I learned for the first time for me about this extraordinary woman of Buffalo, Mary Burnett Talbert. She graduated from Oberlin College during an era when very few women, and particularly very few women of color, were able to attend college. She was a participant in the Niagara Movement, which was a precursor of the NAACP. She was a crusader against lynching. She drove an ambulance in France during World War I. She was pivotal in the effort to preserve the home of Frederick Douglass in Washington. She was a woman of national importance, and I wish someone would write her biography. Learning about Mary Talbert opened my eyes to Buffalo's flourishing and prosperous black community of the early part of the 20th century. Learning about Mary Talbert also opened my eyes to an awful side of the Pan American Exposition, and that's the ethnographic exhibitions on the Midway. There were exhibits about Africans, Native Americans, Japanese people, Hawaiians, and others, exhibits that displayed human beings to passers-by. Mary Talbert was especially horrified by the so-called Old Plantation exhibit, and this becomes a plot element in City of Light, her fight to, if she could, close down the Old Plantation exhibit, but failing that, have an exhibition be included on the achievements of black Americans. Now, I learned after my novel was published that she was in fact successful in her campaign to have a special exhibition included on the achievements of black Americans. Um, the evidence of this exhibition was lost for decades, but it was finally rediscovered right here in this library but after City of Light had already been published. So the, my plot would have changed if only I had, had known this piece of information. Um, but it shows you that new discoveries are being made constantly and we must constantly reevaluate um, how we judge things in the past. So slowly through the course of my research, I was able to conjure up the old city until it became more real to me, really, than the city I'd grown up in. I'd look at a parking lot. This is the parking lot at Canisius High School. And I'd see the Milburn Mansion, that, where McKinley died. I'd look at this hideous, horrifying superhighway that it divides Buffalo in two. And I'd see the graceful Olmsted Parkway that was once here. 
I began to find unexpected traces of the old city all around me. This is the gate on West Ferry Street to John Albright's estate. I'd walked and driven by this a million times without ever knowing what it was or what it represented. This is the Coatsworth House on Cottage Street, and a scene in City of Light takes place in this house. It's surrounded by tiny houses um, in a very historic neighborhood. And you suddenly come upon it, and it's not expected. It's really a little shocking to see it rising up there. Gradually, I found that City of Light became the story of two cities, the Buffalo I grew up in, in the 1960s and 70s, which was a city that was economically depressed and offered only limited options to its young people. And second, the exuberant, prosperous city of 1901, one of the centers of America. The Buffalo that I grew up in hovers in the background of my novel, providing a silent perspective and commentary on the past. One could not have been written without the other. I love this particular photo, of course, because it shows where we are right now. Uh, that is the original main branch of the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library that you see there across from the Hotel Lafayette. Nowadays, Buffalo is transforming itself again. Life is still terribly difficult here for many people. And yet, when I visit, I sense a growing energy and a spirit of possibility. The Olmsted parks and parkways have recovered from the blight of Dutch elm disease and from their years of civic neglect. And today, they look gorgeous. Much of their recovery happened because the community organized to fight for their parks. This is something I've noticed over and over in Buffalo that things change when the community organizes to fight for what people believe in. So this clipping is from 1971. People were already organizing then to help the, the parkways recover from Dutch elm disease. And this effort led to the Buffalo Parks Conservancy, which now manages the park. The Buffalo community also organized to rebuild Humboldt Parkway and reunite the east side. And as you probably have read, this dream of decades, of decades of grassroots effort to make this happen is now finally happening. The federal government and the state have united to cover over this highway and reunite these two communities. And this is what the completed project will look like. Of course, there's still a tremendous amount of work to be done here to create an equitable city where no one is left behind. But I do always hope that someday Buffalo will become a true city of light in the fullest possible meaning of that phrase. Thank you very much.